Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris. You're watching NBC News Now. Here's what's happening. To be able just to like live life freely outside again, um, to enjoy like the beauty and the nature that God has blessed us all with. Like it's just really exciting. This weekend, kicking off our nearly normal summer, Americans taking to the roads, the skies, and the beaches for Memorial Day weekend. We aren't just saving lives, we're getting our lives back. Stores and restaurants up and down Main Street are hanging open signs on their front doors. President Biden now with a $6 trillion budget plan, how he plans to build back our economy. And more painful than anything he has ever experienced. Tiger Woods talking for the first time since his car accident back in February. What else he's saying about his post-crash injuries. I am next. We start today with NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster. <laughs> Shaq, I can't look at you without laughing. Oh, my God. You have the best gig in the game. Looking terrific. <laughs> Not Shaq, bad, right? Um, Miami. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. I, I, I can't even talk to you. This is incredible. How beautiful. <laughs> All right. So, listen, we know Miami's been open and busy for much of the pandemic. But tell us what's different this uh, holiday weekend besides that guy in the Speedo behind you. <laughs> I'm not going to look around then now that you said that. But I think the fact that you Don't have people it. here Don't on Miami it. Beach, that's the big difference. <laughs> that's the big difference that you have this year around. I mean, you look back to Memorial Day last year. Miami Beach was closed. Uh, while you can go up and down the Florida coast and go to different beaches, you definitely didn't see what you're seeing right now, which is a packed beach. People having a good time on this Memorial Day weekend. And oh, look, man. people are leaning into this. This is what officials have been wanting. This is what they have been calling for. And this is what they are expecting and that's why they've been calling people in they say yes follow those common safety measures uh, but enjoy your time enjoy your memorial day weekend especially when you look at the numbers when you look at how many people have been vaccinated they are inviting tourists and welcoming people back now it's also important to note that Miami got a hint of some of this, uh, what this would look like during the spring break weeks. And that's when you saw the clashes between uh, law enforcement and you saw uh, vacationers who just did not want to yeah. abide by the curfew. And you saw those clashes and dramatic and chaotic scenes. Well, they have stepped up security measures here to try to avoid that this time around. But it also helps that there are fewer measures, fewer uh, restrictions in place this time around that law enforcement has to enforce. So that's the scene that you have here. You have people just having a good time. Uh, and I'll tell you, just being able to look at folks sure. and look at the smiles on people's faces, I, many of them have told me it's well overdue, Allison. Oh, my God. Shaq, we got a guy behind you who's living his best life. He's got a cocktail. He's dancing behind you. It's probably not his first cocktail. I mean, <laughs> these guys, these guys are doing it right for Memorial Day weekend. Allison is talking about you. He, I, I think we invited someone over, Allison. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name, sir? He's Rodrigo. Real, he's real, he's Rodrigo. Real Rodrigo. Yeah, Rodrigo. What is it? <laughs> what is it like to be out here right now? Memorial Day weekend. Yeah, we're coming from New York. Enjoy this weekend. And I'm glad to see you. You're so handsome. Oh, wow. Thank you, Rodrigo. Appreciate that. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming over. Hey. There you go. Thanks for coming over. Enjoy your time. All right. There you go, Allison. <laughs> What, what, what a smart man. One, he left New York for Miami. We're going to have the worst weather in New York this weekend. What a good move. And, and he appreciates a very handsome Shaq yeah. Brewster, as we all do. Uh, Shaq, just to I'll be, be serious for a second, though. <laughs> you deserve it. Yeah. Just to be serious for a second, uh, talking about vaccinations. More than half of U.S. adults 18 and over yeah. are fully vaccinated. What are you hearing from tourists about whether that's changing their travel plans this summer, what that means for them? Because that vaccination mark, just, you know, getting that shot in the arm has been uh, such a game changer, such an important mark for so many of us. Exactly. For so many people, they say that's what made them comfortable to come out here. And I think that's a point that you hear when you talk to folks that for some of them, this is the first vacation that they have had since the start of this pandemic. And that's why they're coming to Miami. They now feel that level of comfort with the vaccination that they have and the vaccinations that exist broadly. I want you to listen to some of the conversations I had here with folks a little bit earlier today. Feels good. Like I said, people, yes. everyone kind of just ready to go out and things get back to normal. And it's, it's not such there an yet, energy. but it's getting there and you can feel the vibe. I'm not ready to be in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but yeah, you know, like, like, like she said, you know, as long as everybody's taking their proper precautions, being safe, 
I mean, the crowd shouldn't be too much. I got my vaccine. So I feel great right now. <laughs> Not having to wear the masks um, is also, I feel like people can actually, you know, see who I am, you know, actually see my full face. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely, it's coming along, it's come a long way. And you have local officials leaning into the fact that so many crowds are coming. They have pop-up vaccination sites where no res reservations required. You can come in, walk in, and get your shot. They'll have that all through the weekend as folks come down to Miami Beach to have a good Memorial Day weekend. Allison? Oh, Shaq, you've covered some, some challenging and rough and, and heavy assignments over the years. So happy to see you enjoying yourself there at the beach. I hope there's a cocktail in your future, my friend. Thank you, Allison, definitely. <laughs> AAA expects more than 37 million Americans will hit the road this weekend. That's up 60 percent from this time last year. And it's great news for businesses who rely on those tourists to survive. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber is in Scottsdale, Arizona. All right, Ellison, I understand you're at a party bike rental spot in Scottsdale. First of all, mm -hmm. I got to ask, what on earth is a party bike? I'm old. And uh, what are you hearing from business owners there? <laughs> You know, I did not know what a party bike was until recently. I have never been on one, but this is it. I mean, if if reporting doesn't okay, work me out feel for better. me, I'm hoping by the end of today, I will know how to drive this. So I have also found out that this is very popular with bachelorette parties. I just saw another one arriving, so they could be walking behind us any minute. Maybe getting on this one with me, we will see. But yeah, this is one of many businesses in the area that says right now, they are just seeing a surge of people coming back ready to get out and just have some fun. Listen to what the owner of this party bus rental place, party bike rental place, told us a little while ago. Arizona typically has a slow season over the summer. I'm probably expecting this to be one of our best slow seasons ever. This isn't just a regional thing just for Arizona. I think this is nationwide. Everyone's looking to travel. Everyone's looking to get out and have fun with their friends. I think that's the big takeaway. So we've talked to a couple different businesses, a couple that are kind of like adventure outside businesses like this one, as well as restaurants. And one thing that we're hearing that's pretty interesting is as they're seeing people come back and big crowds coming in for the holiday weekend, they say that international travel, which typically makes up around 10 percent of some of their businesses, that has gone away. They used to get a lot of people coming from Canada. None of that. But they're still seeing their numbers get really close or even past pre-pandemic levels because they say people from nearby states who maybe don't want to travel as far as they would in the past or who might maybe would have gone internationally themselves in the past are now coming here to do something like this outside. And now that they're vaccinated, especially kind of finally just get a little bit of a break. AAA is expecting about 765,000 people to come to Arizona this Memorial Day weekend. And that wow. is up 61 percent compared to this time last year, Allison. I can't wait till AAA starts running stats on party bikes, Allison. That looks like a very good time. Uh, I know you've also been talking to tourists. What are they saying this Memorial Day weekend? I mean, mm -hmm. finally, right? We're, we're getting a, a, out of this, it feels like. Yeah. Yeah, one of uh, the bachelorettes, actually, that we met, you played a little bit of her <laughs> interview at the beginning of the show. Her name is Lorena Tolson, and and she told me, you know, this is really exciting for her. She got engaged in the pandemic. She's about to get married. She's with her friends. But she said this really is so much more than kind of just a party weekend for her, because what the the last year, the isolation, the separation has made her realize is how important her friendships and her relationships are. And so to finally all be vaccinated and get back together again, she said it was sort of hard to describe. And she even choked up a little bit as she was so Aww. beautifully speaking, saying that it, it really meant Aww. the world to her to just be able to have this moment with her friends. Oh, I get it. We're all missing our friends these days. So excited to see them. So how about hiring in Arizona, Ellison? I mean, we know a lot of people are looking for work, but we're also hearing a lot of businesses saying that they just can't find anyone. What's the story there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we talked to three different small businesses in the last 24 hours or so. The owners of this party bike rental place, as well as uh, owners of a hot air balloon company, and also uh, restaurant owners. And 
What we've heard from companies like this one and also the hot air balloon company is that they didn't have any issue getting workers back in. They said that as demand went up, they weren't totally sure what to expect heading into this summer, especially. But as their demand has gone up, they said they really haven't had a problem getting their employees to come back. That being said, this company, for example, they did say, well, we pay our workers at or above minimum wage. The workers who get tips, we pay them minimum wage $15 in addition to tips. So we didn't have an issue. We've heard of other places having where maybe people are making more money staying at home and getting the paid unemployment checks at this point in time. But when we talked to restaurants, it was a bit of a different situation. They say they are having some difficulty getting their staffing levels back up to what they were. Listen to what uh, one woman told us. She had actually just finished working a shift as a server. She's in management and has been working for 17 years. But because they're a little bit short staffed, she had to step in and help with an event. Listen here. It's a little bit challenged with the labor. We definitely are short staffed. It's very tough. You know, we put out ads and not a lot of people answer. So luckily we have our core staff of people who want to work and who are working five, six, seven days a week. And so she said they're kind of just balancing right now, having so many people wanting to come back, bigger crowds, but then also needing to kind of pick up some gaps. They said most of their staff has come back, but that last little bit to kind of put them back to full pre-pandemic levels, they haven't come back just yet. Allison. Ellison, I just did a quick Google search while you were talking, and I'm noticing there's a shortage of party bike rentals in the New York metropolitan area. I, I see it now. Ellison and Ellison's party bike rental. I think it has a good ring to it. Yes, I'm in. <laughs> they are calling it Car Mageddon, a rental card shortage all across America. So, what does that mean if you're hoping to take a road trip this summer? Here's NBC News correspondent Cal Perry. Allison, as America gears up for a big travel weekend, the weak link might be rental cars. Now, this is a seasonal thing where rental car companies will sell their fleets. They do it every year. Last year, they sold a few more cars than they normally would. About 700,000 cars were sold last year. And the problem is rental cars can't replace that fleet. Part of it is an issue with semiconductors. That is a global economic issue. They're not able to replace the cars as quickly as they otherwise would. I had a chance to speak to Brian Kelly. He's the points guy about this yesterday. He has some tips for folks who may be headed out this weekend. Sign up for car rental loyalty programs. They can save you hours by showing up and they'll have the car ready. And if they don't have cars available, those customers who don't have a loyalty number on file are the first to unfortunately get their reservations canceled. Uh, a lot of credit cards will also give you elite status with rental cars. So call up your credit card, see if they have any perks and book as far in advance as possible and book directly with the car rental agency. If you book through a random online travel agency trying to get a deal, uh, those reservations are often the ones not honored if there's a shortage. If worse comes to worse, travel experts are saying you can always go to those rideshare apps, Uber or Lyft, though you can expect to pay more. Everything is more expensive these days, especially those services as people know that rental cars are in hot demand. The other thing that is happening around the country is car dealerships. Some of them at least are starting to rent cars due to the shortage. Let's go to NBC News Now correspondent Simone Boyce. She's got the Friday Memorial Day weekend edition of the headlines from NBCNews.com. Simone, you know the Friday headlines are our favorite. And holiday edition, even better, Allison. We're going to kick things off today in Idaho. That's where the governor is issuing his own executive order after the lieutenant governor banned mask requirements in the state. So that move actually came as a surprise to Governor Brad Little, who was away for a conference when all this happened. He put out a statement saying, quote, I do not like political stunts over the rule of law, adding he would return the law to the way it was before allowing local governments to make their own decisions on masks. Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeechan signed her executive order Thursday, just days after announcing a run for governor. And the uh, Pennsylvania Parole Board turning down comedian Bill Cosby's petition to be released, citing his refusal to participate in a therapy program for sexually violent predators. Now, Cosby is currently serving a 10-year prison sentence. He would have become eligible for parole on September 25th after completing the three-year minimum term of his sentence. 
And in California, the state's energy regulator warning residents could see blackouts again this summer due to high temperatures. Officials say they have backup power, but residents should still expect to hear from utility companies about how they can conserve energy during the hottest months. So last summer, power was temporarily shut off for hundreds of thousands of customers when the state was impacted by that extremely warm weather and wildfires. Well, the European Commission is giving TikTok a one-month deadline to answer complaints over its commercial practices, this after alleged breaches of consumers' rights. The commission says some terms in the Chinese-owned app's policies could be considered misleading and confusing. And Houston, we might have a problem here. NASA's experimental Mars helicopter going on a wild space ride after a navigation timing error confused the aircraft. Now, it happened during Ingenuity's sixth, te sixth test flight, but it managed to land safely. Now, this is its first major problem since the helicopter took flight on the red planet last month. Just wanted to go for a little joy ride. I mean, can you blame it? It was excited to be on Mars. Absolutely. <laughs> I would be too, Simone. Can't blame him at all. Thanks so much. We'll see you in an hour. <laughs> Remember the SolarWinds hack? Well, Microsoft says the same Russian group is at it again, targeting 150 different organizations, including government agencies. NBC News correspondent Ken Delaney and joining me now. So, Ken, what do you know about this new hack and what is Microsoft doing about it? Allison, Microsoft calls this group Nobelium, but the U.S. government calls it the Russian SVR, one of the highest ranking intelligence agencies. And this is a classic cyber espionage campaign where they were trying to use spear phishing to get access to groups they wanted to spy on, humanitarian and development agencies. But the disturbing thing about it was they used a U.S. government agency, the U.S. Agency for International Development. They impersonated that agency and sent out some 3,000 emails trying to get people to click on the bad links and grant them access. It's not clear that it was very successful, but what it shows is the persistence of this kind of Russian spying, and it's Chinese spying as well, um, on American institutions. And it's probably something that President Biden's going to bring up with Vladimir Putin um, when they meet very shortly, Allison. Yeah, I, I was just going to ask you about that. I mean, they're meeting in just two and a half weeks. What are you hearing from the White House or the Kremlin? Uh, uh, clapping back about this one? So this is a it's a delicate it's a more delicate issue than you might think. Right. Because this is yeah. not a, a cyber attack where they were trying to destroy things. This was spying. And guess what? The United States spies on the Russians as well. We do this kind of thing, maybe not in this <laughs> right. exact way. But what the Biden administration is trying to do is maybe uh, create some international rules of the road to try to decide what's in bounds and what's out of bounds. What Microsoft is saying is this was far too broad an attack. This is you guys are compromising the supply yeah. chain and 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 going Going after suppliers of this U.S. government agency and blasting out 3,000 emails, that shouldn't happen. And so it's possible that the Biden administration is going to try to uh, raise with the Russians. Are there, is there an agreement we can come to about what's inbounds and what's out of bounds? But in the world of spying, we've yet to see any kind of agreement like that, Allison. It's a really tough area to regulate. Yeah, it seems like a difficult one to navigate. Ken, I am so looking forward to that meeting and what comes out of it. It's certainly going to be a good one. Oh, yeah. Thanks so much, and uh, have a great weekend. President Biden unveiling a $6 trillion budget proposal for 2022 today as the White House looks to reshape our economy. NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba joining me now. Monica, $6 trillion is a whole lot of cash. Let's talk about where it's going and how the president's explaining his price tag. And this is his first budget, right, Allison? So this is really sort of a wish list of priorities and where the president would like to spend a lot of this money. But this is pretty contingent on it even getting passed through Congress first. But what he did include in this blueprint is what we already know about his jobs and infrastructure and families plan, which is, of course, about $4 trillion combined, though we don't know what the final price tag will be for that. And then an additional $1.5 trillion on domestic programs, things like health, education, there's also a lot of money carved out there for helping to combat the climate crisis. And how would he propose paying for all of this? Again, that's a subject of a lot of disagreement right now in these negotiations with Republicans. But what the president would like to see is for taxes to go up on corporations and on the wealthiest Americans. So this is a White House that's trying to present themselves as feeling optimistic, wanting to inject all of this because they feel that would help the economy recover more quickly. And their prediction in this 
latest budget that they put out today is that they could lower the unemployment rate to below 4 percent, Allison, by 2023 if all of this agenda was enacted. Monica, President Biden also meeting with Virginia's governor this morning to highlight that state's progress fighting COVID-19. What's going on in Virginia that the White House is so happy about it? They feel like it's a model for what the president wants to see around the country. So today, Virginia is lifting a lot of its COVID restrictions, and that's because of the pace of vaccination. So the president, of course, has that goal by the 4th of July of wanting to get at least 70 percent of all adults with one dose. They are well on their way to that. But a state like Virginia is a great example because they're very close to getting to that percentage point. So the White House, in unveiling their economic priorities, of course, with this budget, they also wanted to highlight what they believe will help help contribute to a lot of this in terms of climbing out of the fallout. And that is this issue of continuing with vaccinations. Take a listen to how the president specifically talked about Virginia and the governor there today. This has been true here in Virginia, particularly from 43,000 cases the week before I took office to fewer than 2,800 in the past week, a 93 percent decline. Families are heading down to spend Memorial Day weekend at Virginia Beach and all over the country. We've gone from pain and stagnation of a long, dark winter to an economy on the move growing faster than it has in nearly 40 years. The president there making the point also that think about just a couple of months ago, he couldn't have been able to hold an event like that in an indoor climbing gym without wearing a mask. So really, he wanted to highlight all the progress made as he does talk to Americans going into this holiday weekend about hopefully their ability to enjoy this three day stretch as something very, very different, of course, Allison, to where we were a year ago. But he also wanted to stress that people shouldn't be complacent, that those who still haven't gotten vaccinated really need to think about doing so. And he wanted to encourage more and more people to do it, saying it's easier to get access to those shots than it has ever been. So the White House really hoping that last chunk of people who might still be on the fence make up their mind pretty soon as we head toward those summer milestones, Allison. Yeah, don't be complacent, but wow, what a long way we have come. Monica Alba, thank you so much. Shame on the Republican Party for trying to sweep the horrors of that day under the rug because they're afraid of Donald Trump. Senate Republicans blocking a bill to create a January 6th commission that would investigate the Capitol riots. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Leanne Caldwell joining us from the Russell Rotunda. Leanne, we didn't expect this bill to pass, but what else are lawmakers saying about today's failed vote? Hey, Allison. Well, it depends on where you stand. Democrats say that this vote is extremely unfortunate. Uh, one Democrat that I spoke to, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, he put it in very blunt terms, saying that Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell is making this extremely difficult, saying that he is using his power as minority leader to uh, enforce the will, his will, on his members. Because let's be clear, the reason the Republicans did not support this legislation, or only six of them did, is because of the rest of them followed what Senate Minority Leader McConnell has said, both publicly and privately, to his conference, which is that he does not support this legislation. So this was a day where Democrats said, are going to point to as Republicans refusing to face the consequences of what happened on January 6th, and they're going to continue to use this and throughout the rest of the year um, and even into an election year. This could still be a very political issue, Allison. Leah, Majority Leader Schumer saying today in a Dear Colleagues letter that this isn't over. So what's his plan? Well, that's exactly right. He did say that he uh, reserves the right to call this up for a vote again. And he also said that perhaps there will be additional investigations. Um, he also addressed this um, in a press conference earlier today. And let's listen to what he said, and we'll talk on the other side. Senators should rest assured that the events of January 6 will be investigated and that as majority leader, I reserve the right to force the Senate to vote on the bill again at the appropriate time. So, Allison, there's two things there. He said that he could bring it up for a vote again. I don't expect the vote tally 
to change as far as Republicans are concerned, that there would be any more that would vote for it. But he also hinted very strongly at the fact that Senate Democrats, along with House Democrats, could open their own investigations, either through a select committee or using the committee structure that already exists. So he promised investigations, and he also um, threatened to make Republicans vote on the issue in the future. Leanne, ahead of the vote, Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski called out her colleagues for opposing the bill. Why did she side with the Democrats here? Well, instead of framing it as siding with the Democrats, I'd say it's more that Lisa Murkowski mm -hmm. has been very clear throughout this entire process since January 6th, since the election, really, um, of where she stands. And she is very disappointed in her colleagues because she thinks that her colleagues need to do the what is right instead of what is politically expedient. Let's listen to what she said. We just can't pretend that nothing bad happened or that people just got too excitable. Something bad happened. And it's important to lay that out. And Allison, Senator Murkowski is someone who is up for re-election in a state that the former president, Donald Trump, easily won up in 2022. She is, you know, the former president has said he is going to campaign for her, against her, um, help a primary opponent. And so she is doing this despite what her political future might yeah. be. She thinks that this is incredibly important and she's doing this in spite of what um, happens in the future. So, and she's standing very strong. So she's definitely a profile and courage on this and really many issues yeah. involving the former president, Allison. Yes, yeah, certainly putting her job on the line there for something she thinks matters. Leanne, before we let you go, I just have to yeah. ask, there is always an echo, sounds of people in the Russell Rotunda. When we were tossing to you just now, I feel like you could hear a pin drop. Did everyone just get the heck out of Dodge a long time ago? Um, yes, people were, did not expect to be <laughs> here on Friday. And so the second Senate vote finished their work, they are gone. <laughs> I was going to say props to you, Leanne, because it sounds like you're one of very few people still working there today. Thank you so much for sticking around. Of course. The gunman in the San Jose rail yard shooting was a highly disgruntled VTA employee for many years, according to the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office. Police also releasing new surveillance video that shows the shooter walking through the rail yard before opening fire. NBC News correspondent Jake Ward is near the gunman's home in San Jose. Jake, it is so eerie just watching that video. We're also hearing a chilling account from a VTA worker who was at work and survived that attack. What is he saying? That's right, Allison. More and more accounts are coming out as we look into this investigation. It, of course, began with the surveillance video that we knew about from yes, excuse me, from Wednesday morning that showed him getting into his truck. Then we've seen this new surveillance video that shows him walking across the rail yard. You can see here behind me, you know, and now we're hearing from people who are actually there at the time and they reveal a portrait of someone who seems to have been specifically targeting certain employees. Have a listen. Sam was always on the outside. He was never in the group. He was never accepted by anybody there. He was pissed off at certain people. He was angry and he took his vengeance out on very specific people. Now, Allison, at this point, there are 50 FBI agents plus representatives of other agencies working, not just uh, VTA Rail Yard, where I am, not just the House, but three other places besides uh, looking for more clues as to why and how this happened. Yeah. Jake, a widow of one of the victims speaking with NBC News this afternoon. What is she saying? How is she remembering her husband? You know, at this point, it's really been an extraordinary day to, to, to watch, you know, everything from uh, lone bus drivers getting off their shift and stopping at this makeshift memorial that's downtown, paying homage to their fallen comrades, and then to actually listen to, in this case, the widow of uh, a 49-year-old uh, gunned down at work. Have a listen to her words. They're incredible. I just said, I love you. I don't want you to go, but I know you have to. 
it's okay. We'll be okay. <laughs> and his heart stopped. And he took a couple breaths. And then he died. <laughs> I've lost everything. I mean, literally, I have moments of like, I just want to go with him. I don't want to be here without him. And she said, Allison, that the hospital staff actually made room in the bed for the two of them to lie together and that their three children were actually able to be present oh. when he passed. I mean, we just have a community reeling here across this city uh, from a terrible tragedy. And as you say, you know, as you learned that, you know, just just how horrible it was. This seems to have been so premeditated and so deadly. So heartbreaking. Uh, Jake, thanks so much for your reporting. We really appreciate it. It's time for the bottom line, our daily look at what's going on in the business world and beyond. The market's heading into Memorial Day on a bit of a high note. The Dow closing up 64 points, all three major averages posting a winning week. Let's bring in Investopedia editor-in-chief Caleb Silver. Uh, so, Caleb, what sent stock prices higher this week? What were the markets excited about? The recovery rally, Allison, is still intact, and we've been talking about it for weeks, but investors are still betting yeah. on a recovery in travel stocks, in energy stocks, in industrial stocks, in transportation stocks, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing tech stocks slump a little bit, but we've had four straight months of gains for the S&P 500. European markets, Allison, hitting a record high, but we also saw this week the return of meme stocks, the game stops, and the AMC entertainments of the world. Wild trading rides for these stocks as individual retail investors, especially that Wall Street Bets crowd jumped on these short positions in AMC Entertainment, the movie theater company, and in GameStop. AMC was up 100% at one point this week, Allison. So it was very strange. And then we have a that's reckoning so for cryptocurrencies that's been going on. This reckoning in cryptocurrencies that's been going on for several weeks as regulators start to tighten the rules or plan to tighten the rules around the trading and investing of Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, Dogecoin, et cetera. All, all those coins that I'm too afraid to go anywhere near because the volatility just makes me so nervous. Uh, Caleb, how about the economy? Everyone wants to know when things will really be back to normal. So what did we learn this week? Where is this recovery right now? Yeah, we, we learned a lot this week. This was pretty informative because we just got the report yeah. this morning mm -hmm. on consumer spending in sentiment for April. Kind of flat. You get the feeling like consumers may be a little petered out here. We know that wealthier consumers are spending more than those with lower incomes. They usually do but especially during this recovery. But we did see this flattening of spending, and that may be because the savings rate fell in the past month because those stimulus checks went out in April. They did not go, I mean, in March, they did not go out in April. So folks were saving less and then spending just a little bit less. It only rose 0.5%. There's that. And then the housing market, which, as you know, has been red hot, started to cool a little bit. The average home price is $372,000. That's an enormous jump from last year. But existing home sales and new home sales are both slow a little bit, which tells you that there's not a lot of inventory out there and the prices out there may be out of reach for consumers looking to buy right now. So those are two big things. So we're watching that, but we're also watching what's happening with inflation because we did see a 3.1% increase in personal consumer expenditures in this month compared to last year. Of course, we know where we were last year. They're getting, things are more expensive. Inflation's everywhere. The Federal Reserve and the Biden administration will tell you it's only temporary. That's consumers out there. They think it's here for a while. We mentioned the Biden administration, President Biden out with a six trillion dollar budget proposal today. The big question a lot of people have, where's all that cash coming from? Yeah. Well, if he has it his way, that'll come from higher taxes. And those are higher taxes on corporations yeah. where he wants to raise the corporate tax rate from 21 percent, where President Trump put it in the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act, to 28 percent. He also wants to raise the minimum global tax to 15 percent. He wants to tax wealthy Americans, those earning $400,000 or more, raise taxes on them. And he also wants to raise the capital gains rate from 23.8 percent to as high as 43.4 percent. Does all of this pay for the amount of the $6 trillion over the next 10 years? Not even close. We're about to do some serious deficit spending, and we've already been doing it, but get ready for some massive deficits that'll surpass the World War II records. All right. Speaking of federal spending, you got the term of the week, MMT. What's that stand for? 
Oh, that's modern monetary theory, and you're going to hear a ton about this. And this has actually been going on for quite a while, back when Bernie Sanders was running for president. But this is modern monetary theory, which is basically a theory that governments can print their own fiat, who print their own fiat currency, should print as much as they need for federal spending because they can't go insolvent unless they decide to do so. So modern monetary theorists will say, just keep spending. Don't worry about deficits. Deficits are a thing of the past. We don't worry about those anymore. If we couldn't, if governments can't spend what they need to to get out of recessions or get out of economic emergencies, we could have an economic collapse. So you're going to hear a lot about modern monetary theory because we're going to go into some serious deficit spending of about $1.8 trillion over the next 10 years, over about 117% of GDP. That's going to be a record. Caleb, it is a short week ahead because of Memorial Day, but still a lot going on. What's on tap? Yeah, so next week we're looking for uh, more manufacturing reports, but also not just the U.S., but around the world. We know that big manufacturing countries like Germany, uh, like Australia, other parts of Europe have done very well, even Canada. So we're looking for manufacturing reports around the world. We're looking for that budget battle to really begin in full force. Now that the president has put his budget proposal out there, there's going to be battling and lobbying going on like you've never read about, like you've never seen. But also key for us next week is the May jobs report. Remember in April, we thought we'd get a million jobs added. We only got 200 66,000. That was a huge miss. Are people yeah. getting out of their homes and going to work or not? We're expecting 700,000 jobs plus in the May jobs report. We'll see if that actually happens because we know about half the states are ending that $300 a week uh, unemployment benefit that they put out there. So folks are going to have to get a job because those benefits are coming to an end soon. Yeah. And Caleb, I hope you have some big, uh, good Memorial Day weekend plans. I know I'll be throwing on my brand new Investopedia hoodie sweatshirt this weekend. I'm rolling on down to Boswick's. How about yourself? I want to see you in that, eating some clams. Have a great weekend. <laughs> have a great one. We'll see you next Friday. A memorial march down Black Wall Street honoring the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre. Greenwood was one of the wealthiest black neighborhoods in America until a white mob burned it down, killing hundreds of people, destroying businesses and livelihoods. For many folks in Tulsa, the trauma for that day is still so very raw. MSNBC Cross Connection anchor Tiffany Cross is in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Tiffany, tell us what's going on there this weekend and what does this weekend mean for folks there? That's right, Alice. And I'm standing here right in the heart of the Greenwood District, where 100 years ago today, it was laid to rubble by white, violent aggressors uh, who destroyed the community. And you can still feel the divide here today. Uh, you know, the north part of Tulsa is uh, comprised of predominantly black residents. It's a food desert. Um, the economic impact is still clearly seen in the housing, the education system, uh, while the people in power who are likely descendants of the people who committed this atrocity still run things, still narrow the path to the ballot box. And as you know, there are two different activities happening here. So there was the official commission that was run by uh, mostly white participants and the Republican governor uh, who was recently kicked off and the Republican mayor here, Mayor G.T. Bynum. And then there was the Legacy Fest. And this was something that was run by the actual descendants and survivors. And those celebrations continue while the commission has been canceled. I just want to note that the commission has raised $30 million, Allison. And how much of that money have they actually given to the descendants and survivors, the people who were actually impacted? Zero. So not too many people were here shedding Ugh. a tear that, that, that those activities were canceled. However, yeah. as you can see, there's a lot of activity around me. There's music. It's a festive atmosphere to finally acknowledge what happened here in Tulsa 100 years ago. I mean, Tiffany, talking to you, we just hear get more of a, an understanding of how black families have struggled there for decades uh, emotionally and financially to rebuild. Could you talk to us a little bit more about the lasting impact on the community and what kinds of specific changes community leaders there are asking for? Yeah, so uh, I had great conversations here. I just want to note that Tulsa was not an anomaly. It was the norm for black life in America at that time. So though we're here in Tulsa, there are many yeah. massacres that took place across this country. But I did have the opportunity to speak to some descendants of the Tulsa massacre, and they have very specific ideas on what restitution means for them. Take a listen. Justice can only come in the form of restitution, reparations, and repair triple R effect, right? <laughs> That's the only, there hasn't been any viable solution, right? We still have to get voting rights <laughs> renewed. That's not even permanent, right? And we're looking for permanent, sustainable change. And we're not going to get that 
through any other means. It just, it, it hasn't happened and it won't happen. For us as descendants, you know, what would our lives have been if we weren't robbed of our generational wealth? You know, I, I often sit back and ponder about that. I, I ponder about Laurel Strafford with her great grandfather having the nicest hotel as a black man in the world. He could have been the Hilton. He could have been Marriott. He could have been the Hyatt. So as you see, this had a rippling effect. It rippled through time and generations and still has an impact here today. And just like a lot of cities across the country, when Tulsa was re-erected, it was done so under economic oppression. They built a highway right through the city here so people would not be able to rebuild in a more sustainable way. And so as we have these conversations around infrastructure, these are conversations that are happening all across America with the construction uh, of American cities that were done so, quite frankly, with institutional racism at the root of some of this construction. So a lot of necessary conversations happening as we face this racial reckoning the country's having tomorrow. And I'm so looking forward to hosting a two-hour special uh, tomorrow on MSNBC as we unpack a lot of these issues and have some of those uncomfortable conversations. But we have to get comfortable in our discomfort so we can create the country that many people believe America to be. Well, Tiffany, we are looking forward uh, to that special show tomorrow as well. Thank you so much uh, for coming on with us today on News Now to give us a preview. As Tiffany mentioned, she's anchoring a special edition of The Cross Connection from Tulsa tomorrow morning. You can catch The Cross Connection, America's Racial Reckoning, at 10 a.m. Eastern, Saturday on MSNBC. From COVID-19 to the death of George Floyd and calls to defund the police, it has been a challenging year for law enforcement and even harder one for black officers. NBC Today anchor Craig Melvin spoke with three of them about their experiences and the changes they'd like to see going forward. What has it been like being a, a, a police officer over the past year? You know, uh, I will say this. It, it, it's been hard, right? And um, those, those hard times um, have not existed solely within the last year. But being black and, and seeing the police misconduct, whether or not you're an officer or you're not an officer, unfortunately, the feeling is the same. Uh, we, there's been same feelings that you've had uh, of trauma and, and turmoil uh, from seeing Rodney King uh, up into Mike Brown up until now and Rodney on Green. Um, so the feeling has been the same. And, and that feeling has been heavy. Uh, it's been disbelief. It's been misunderstanding. Uh, it's, at times, it's been hopeless. Uh, but you strive on. I became a cop because I was arrested. I was arrested by a cop, City of Charleston, um, for disobeying an officer. On my way to the city lockup, uh, his partner asked him, uh, what happened to you back there? He told his partner, while well, I'm handcuffed in the back of his car, that he don't know. He just snapped. Wow. Think about it. 17 year old kid handcuffed hearing two officers uh, saying that he didn't know but he had a power and authority to take my freedom. From that point on, I, I, I was on a mission uh, to become a police officer. Uh, I, I wanted to change or have an impact within my, within my community. When I was a younger uh, young man and growing up in, in Harlem, um, I would see how I used to live across the street, directly across the street from the police department, pre police prison, I should say. And I would see how the police interacted with the community. And there was always one police officer who always stood out to me in that community. He always had that positive outlook and very encouraging. In spite of what was going on, that was the one guy that you could always talk to. So as be when I decided to become a police officer, I wanted to be that guy. I wanted to be that guy that the community can trust, the community can believe in, and the community have an opportunity to talk to. I can see the challenges that if the, more, the black community have doing protests. I can empathize with that. With that said, I also empathize with African-American cop who was asked uh, to don their ride here and to, uh, to prevent protests or to uh, go against the protesters. And so that's a struggle. Detective Ham, I want to come back to you for a moment here. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> because I understand, how old is your son? My son is 27. 27 now. Um, when he was younger, what did you tell him about how you should interact with the police? 
Well, with the organization uh, that I participate in, I would hold seminars on how to interact with the police, not just for my son, but for all uh, black kids and, and, and brown kids uh, that would come and listen. The interaction would be to mitigate the, you, you, the your goal is to get away from the situation unscathed, alive, not hurt or whatever, to comply with the police officer and adjudicate the situation at a later date. But after the George Floyd case, I can no longer hold it as conversation because he complied and all the forms that he, he, you know, did all he could to mitigate that situation to get out of it. And yet he still lost his life. So now when I hold these, what to do if stopped by the police, that question comes up. How do I answer that? I can't answer it. I, I can't answer it because there is no answer. The skepticism that has long existed between uh, communities of color and, and law enforcement. How, how do we go about continuing to bridge that, that gap? How do we go about, go about healing, healing those wounds? Your leaders, your, your, um, your police chiefs and your, your sheriffs around the country have to realize that they don't have all the answers. Uh, and just because you sit at the very top of that chain, uh, is you, you want to open a door for the community members to come to the table and have these kind of difficult, complicated dialogues um, and allow them to help you craft certain policies here towards community policing. If you defund the police, then you take away the uh, security of those who want stability in the neighborhood. This is when I when I hear the phrase defund the police, I, I think it's the most ludicrous st thing in the world because it is it, the, it implies that certain communities don't want police protection, which is far from the truth. When I think law enforcement here thinks of, of defund the police, we're not we're not completely understanding what the community is asking for us. The police, the community is telling us that they tired. They are tired of receiving these unjust treatments, these this being subjected to the police misconduct. Detective Ham, um, George Floyd's murder and uh, Derek Chauvin's uh, subsequent conviction for it. What what effect did it have on you as uh, a member of law enforcement? What if, what effect did it have on you as as a black man in America? Well, it's kind of hard to separate the two at that point in time because uh, I'm always going to be an uh, African-American law enforcement officer. But um, I, I felt good. I felt good about it um, because it showed that there is hope for justice. George Floyd opened a discussion about more real, genuine transparency. Most of these protests are over the delay in releasing videos. And when you wait a year, two years down the road to release a video, uh, it's just going to add to anxiety, add to emotional distress within the community, add to complete distrust for government will make our jobs even that much difficult. I can honestly say that when we heard the verdict um, um, for, for Derek Chauvin, um, there was a sigh, I will say that. Um, but by no means did I take this as an indication of the system being fixed. Will he ever play professional golf again? Right now, Tiger Woods says he's just focusing on walking. The golf star giving his first interview since his car crash earlier this year. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk has the story. Tiger Woods, with his steely-eyed focus and desire to win, now facing the most difficult physical challenge of his life, telling Golf Digest in his first interview since February's devastating accident that this rehab was more painful than anything he has ever experienced. From what we know, he almost died. You just look at that vehicle. Woods drove off the road on the morning of February 23rd, the front end of his SUV completely destroyed. Woods, suffering major injuries to his right leg, was trapped inside and had to be extracted by firefighters. The L.A. County Sheriff's Department says he was speeding and lost control. There was no sign that he was impaired, police say, and there were no charges. Woods immediately went into surgery. He wouldn't make it home to Florida until a month later, according to Golf Digest. When asked if he would make a return to golf, Woods didn't comment, instead saying, I am focused on my number one goal right now, walking on my own 
taking it one step at a time. Dan Rappaport interviewed the golf legend. You know Tiger Woods, you've covered him for a while. What do you think he's going to do? I think it's too early from, from their perspective to try to speculate. He, he said his goal right now is to, to walk, right? So that's, that's a long way away from playing golf, which is a long way away from playing competitive golf. Those are two different things. Woods has battled back from injuries before, including five back surgeries. He was still in rehab before the accident. Still in the gym, still doing um, the mundane stuff that you have to do for rehab. Since the crash, Woods has kept a low profile, a few social media posts, a photo with a young girl battling cancer. And he called Phil Mickelson's historic win at age 50 inspirational. And while the road back would be tough, those who know Tiger say don't count him out. If anybody can kind of work hard enough to get themselves to overcome something like this, you know, he'd be the one. You know, he's as determined an athlete as I've ever covered in all the years I've covered sports. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.